Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Cryptids and Monsters video. Yet another entry for this particular series. I think I'm going to do one more after this one, and then a mixtape of sorts after that. And that'll wrap it up for this particular uh, series on there. Um, this particular suggestion actually came from a couple of months back. So again, it goes to show with regards to anything involving your suggestions, if I don't come across it right away and I don't do it right away, I do look back afterward and I try to see if um, I miss particularly anything that stood out and when I do then I talk about it later on on here so again just because you don't see it covered now um, there's a very good chance that you'll be seeing it sometime later on on there and I picked this one because much like um, the black shook that I just talked about um, on my last video this particular story here has to do with real life encounter very famous encounter um, in England that to this day is still talked about on there because it was unfortunately it was like a one of a kind type deal and nothing else has come about it since then but even to this day the impact of it has been uh, there for quite some time and it could provide proof that there is another form of life on this earth not exactly on top of it like like you and I are on top of earth but actually within the earth itself so quite fascinating stuff on there and um, one thing I wanted to note too is with regards to these cryptids that I talk about um, I don't place any kind of judgment on them um, I kind of follow the rule that um, if those of you who know that show um, coast to coast when Art Bell used to be on on there his main rule was when it came to cryptids and when it came to monsters and paranormal and supernatural type stuff that he talked about um, he he always kept like an open mind on them no matter how weird and strange they would sound he, uh, because in his case um, he, he was completely unbiased he just always kept an open mind and allowed whoever was talking about um, the particular subject at that time no matter how strange the conversation got or how in some cases ridiculous the conversation got he always allowed it to go unchecked because he was impartial to it um, in his in his case something that could be considered weird and strange to one person uh, could be considered ridiculous to another one and vice versa and so that's the way I do these videos here is anybody that suggests something on there I just go in with an impartial mind and I just pre create the facts on there and it's up to everyone else to determine uh, whether the stuff that's being talked about is real or was real or could be real along those lines even no matter how fantastical some of the stuff sounds it's there for your uh, for your viewing pleasure so it's yours to decide at that point whether something is completely out of the world type craziness or whether there's a good chance that it's there and case in point is this cryptid I'm going to talk about here they're called the green children of Woolpit and they've been around I mean the story of it has been around for centuries I mean we're talking a very long time but again this this particular instance only happened once and you would have to go back in time to the mid 1100s so that's to give you an idea almost a thousand years in the past in order to uh, get a good idea of what this particular tale entails on there. Um, uh, this took place again in a place called Woolpit which is near and around what was at that time rural England and the way the story goes is like this there's no cryptids involved like weird looking monsters there's no uh, bizarre creatures involved in this case and all it is is actually two regular normal looking children but for the fact that that their skin was completely green and we're talking like green green like ninja turtle type green so they, apparently they were found one day and the time period on this was around 1135 to year 1154 somewhere around there they were found by a gentleman uh, who goes by the name of William of Newburgh well my apologies actually he was not the person that found them but he was the one that talked about them um, in fact his name is the one most cited with being able to discuss uh, the tale of this of, of these uh, green children and so he's the one that's credited with spreading the word associated with it because apparently the person who found these green children was a gentleman by the name of Sir Richard the Colony of Weakest um, and he's the one that found the children and gave them 
uh, refuge afterward. So this gentleman, Sir Richard, uh, it, this all happened again in the years 1135 to 1154. Um, one day he was just walking around that area of Wool Pit, and then he came across a wolf pit. Um, and the wolf pit, you'll see a picture of here, was something used at that time. It probably is still used today um, to capture live animals. And the idea being that it's probably covered in some kind of tarp or some kind of camouflage of some sort, you know, sticks, leaves, that kind of stuff. And then that way, whenever something falls into it, then it's it's captured and then taken later on either for food or for dress, clothing, that kind of stuff. Well, um, this guy, Sir Richard, he found these two children by the wolf pit. And again, their most distinctive, iconic feature, which you'll see here, was that their skin was completely green on there, unlike anything seen before. Um, it's unknown, though, what kind of color of green it was, like whether it was, let's say, grass-type green, or whether it was uh, anything like a darker navy type green or maybe if it was teal green or again like I was saying earlier ninja turtle green no it, um, their skin was just 100 percent green and whenever they talked they apparently spoke some kind of unknown language at that time at least to those people around there uh, they could not discern what they were talking about on there so these children, they were found, no doubt they were probably huddling uh, together as close as possible, unaware of their surroundings, unaware of what was happening on there. But this gentleman, Sir Richard, um, he was apparently a kind gentleman, and he took them home, and he wanted to make sure that they were taken care of. Um, to his surprise, though, they were uh, these children were apparently refusing all manners of food. They did not eat anything that was offered to them. And this happened actually for several days, and no doubt Sir Richard and others around him were starting to get concerned that um, these children, if they didn't eat, something would happen to them. But to their surprise, when they were offered some green beans, ironically green beans, um, they consumed it very, very eagerly. In fact, this was probably the only food that they uh, that they ate for a while because uh, the tales go that they eventually adapted to normal food after a good time period on there. And the ironic thing was in the time period that they adapted to their normal food, that's when their skin color started to change and they lost that green tone on their skin. Uh, so it changed back to a regular pigmentation that you and I know of uh, when it comes to your standard human being. So they lost the green color because of the fact that they were eating normal food on there. Sadly though, um, it turns out that the boy uh, developed some kind of sickness at that time period and he died shortly thereafter um, and so it was his sister that remained and she was the one that was eventually able to tell them uh, where they came from what happened to them and so forth how this came about was that it took a while, but um, it, the tales do not say anything with regards to how long, but eventually that girl, who was, again, the only remaining survivor because of her brother dying, uh, learned English. And once she did, she was able to tell Sir Ralph uh, exactly what had happened. She said she came from a place, a land, where the quote-unquote sun never shone, but that the lights there were like twilight. And then her and her brother had some cattle in and around that area, and they called their home St. Martin's Land, which is interesting, unique, um, because uh, to think that let's by all dispositions uh, they are coming from a place underground, let's say towards anywhere near the center of the earth, and they have a place there called St. Martin's Land. Um, it was very, very fascinating to hear that that they would name it something like that on there. And then she said that um, at that place that they called home at that time, St. Martin's Land, was a place where everything was 100% green, which could denote, again, why their skin color at that time was green, because maybe the pigmentation, uh, the dyes, everything associated with what they ate there made their skin color green. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention on there, um, besides them being found with their skin color green, and speaking a completely different language, the other item of note is their clothing was something that was not resembling anything of that time. It was clothing that was not formal, was unfamiliar is what the word 
that what was described unfamiliar to what everyone else wore at that time these children wore something completely different it wasn't described what they wore it's presumed that it's some kind of clothing that was either out of time or some kind of clothing that was ahead of time um, I don't know on that part but um, whatever they wore at that time nobody ever kept it unfortunately so there's no records of that clothing afterward on there to showcase how it compared to what people wore during that specific era so she was saying um, that her and her brother were tending to some cattle um, in their home and again it's called St. Martin's Land they were herding their cattle and this was for their father which is interesting again because this denotes that wherever they were wherever they came from A. they had families and then B. they had work just like other people were doing at that time in Woolpit um, where people tended cattle they had cattle to graze they were farmers and that simple explanation leads you to believe that even though they were coming from a different place who knows someplace underground or maybe in another dimension they were still doing the same parallel type work that we were at that time there so they were tending their father's cattle when they suddenly heard a very loud noise uh, this noise is not further described anywhere else, so I can't really tell what that noise was. If it was, let's say, the sound of a boom or anything involving like the rumblings of an earthquake, um, something popping open, anything like that, um, is unfortunately it's left very vague. But the gentleman again that writes about this, the guy William of Newburgh, he's the one that says and presumes that it's actually the bells of a place called Bury St. Edmunds. Well, once the children heard this loud noise, <clears throat> they suddenly woke up and found themselves unaware completely of their surroundings, and suddenly they found themselves by the wolf pit where they were later found on there. <clears throat> so somewhere along the ways, um, they were tending that cattle, some loud noise occurred, some loud, unusual, strange noise to them. Uh, they were for better for lack of a better word teleported suddenly to our place to here on earth and that's when they found themselves by the wolf pit where they were found by that gentleman uh, Sir Ralph on there but yeah um, once they were found then the rest of the story goes that that they were lost and they tried to discern their surroundings but they stayed there after all and then that's when um, the rest of the story goes that the up to the present uh, there at that time. What's interesting too is that the girl uh, eventually led a normal life. Um, the, whatever this, uh, wherever this girl came from, whatever she might be, she actually led a normal life. Although she was described many years thereafter of being uh, quote unquote very wanton and impudent. So there goes um, you know a brief description of her lifestyle and her attitudes and her actions. Um, afterward, too, uh, she eventually married a man from a place called King's Lynn, which is about 40 miles from their location, and that's it. She left a, she pretty much left a normal life thereafter on there. Um, in fact, it was concluded, uh, the, the story goes, the one that was being written by that guy, William, he said that eventually he tracked down the girl. And he was able to discern that the girl eventually was given an English name and she was given the name Agnes. And so the person that she married was a gentleman by the name of Richard Bari. So it goes to show that her last name was probably Bari. So her full name in total after she led and married her normal and she led her normal life was Agnes Bari on there. And then that was it. So again, the only instance known of anybody coming across from whatever that dimension was or wherever that location was were these two green children and then these two green children one of them unfortunately died the boy but the other one led a normal life married a gentleman and then that was it and there's been no other instance or situation associated with anybody else of that green type color coming over or being discovered this is strictly just one of a kind but wow uh, what a difference even after almost again a thousand years the story associated with these grandchildren of Woolpit is still going strong on there quite fascinating again when you think about it because um, there were so many people 
that were able to recount this experience and talk about the experience and in the case of that gentleman William uh, write about the experience and spread the word out to the rest of the world that maybe for once in this earth um, again sometime in the years um, mid 1100s to 1150s or so 1135-1150 that sometime within that time period some things um, whatever they were children actually teleported into this earth and um, they were able to survive at least in this case of the girl for up until her natural death and then the boy itself dying a little bit earlier but they were able to talk about where they came from and then tell others about their experience and how they got there so in other words sometime on this earth we had some beings potentially from another place another dimension another location maybe even from the center of the earth somewhere like that and then they were here on earth and then that was it they that's the only time there's ever been that experience has anybody heard of this particular tale the green children of Woolpit? um if so and anybody knows any further tales associated with them you know, please post your comments, share them below. It'll be fascinating to see if anyone else has any more local tales to talk about this, um, especially if anything has to do with, uh, let's say, more recent times. Because again, you have to go back nearly a thousand years to even talk to be able to talk about when these uh, green children first arrived here on Earth. Um, there's also reports, though, that people say. Uh, those that are trying to criticize um, these particular tales, that's that's what they are, essentially. They're tall tales. They're folk tales. They're the imaginations of that writer, uh, William, who uh, his occupation, coincidentally, and it was kind of like a wink-wink uh, type acknowledgement on the stuff that I was reading. He was actually a writer. Um, and so people were saying that these are no doubt the tall tales of a writer that's trying to essentially create something fantastical on there to try to showcase to others um, his skills when it comes to this. And in fact, um, other than the reports coming from that gentleman, Sir Richard, the County of Wickes, who found these children, um, William pretty much states that everything associated with these the tales with these children come from quote unquote reports from a number of trustworthy sources, but he doesn't really go into detail of of where this where these sources are, who they are, where they came from, and so forth. Um, all he talks about is what was told to him by Sir Richard de Conley of Wickes and what the accounts were and then he writes about them there. So again the, um, there are those that say look at that see um, here you have a writer whose only source is one person and at the same time uh, what's to stop this writer from embellishing uh, those tales because this is a writer that's potentially trying to sell books or trying to get his name known or trying to have success, that kind of stuff, fame associated with his writings. So the fact that that could be a possibility is, again, something that stands out. But at the end of the day, um, whether he was doing it on purpose, let's say falsifying information or whether the stuff was real, one cannot deny that these green children of Woolpits and the tale associated with them is still alive to this day on there. In fact, you'll see a picture of here of, an, of it looks like a, I guess you could call it a sign of some sort that was erected back in 1977. So just a couple of decades back, but it again showcases the importance of the children to that area because here you have a sign for those that are entering that place in Woolpit depicting the children right then and there. So fascinating stuff. Again, um, a little bit um, towards the side when it comes to talking about cryptids and monsters because these green children were not anything involving actual cryptids or monsters but the tales associated with them and where they came from um, I picked it here because it was pretty interesting stuff and it was almost on the fantastical side and at the end of the day where they came from um, wherever that might be, a dimension, another planet uh, maybe even something again towards the center of the earth here um, wherever that might be is again it falls into the realm of the usual cryptids and monsters and where they could come from as well so again thank you so much as always for your suggestions take care bye